In this episode of Idea City. Well, if these robots actually do surpass human level creative intelligent capabilities at some point in our lifetime, we want to make sure that they have empathy, that they have compassion, that they get along well with us, that they are wise. So we have to start to understand what that means and start to explore that in machines or else, you know, it's there's a there's a chance that these machines could be sociopathic. They could be psychopathic. We know where that goes, you know, from all the science fiction that we see. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. We did the deep research and, uh, and discovered that the, the god of these things in the commercial world, in the private world, is a guy called David Hansen, whose particular strength is in um, giving lifelike facial features. So uh, we called him up and, and, and made him the modest proposition that he should make a robot in my likeness. And we're kind of set back. I said, sure, um, $250,000. <laughs> so I wasn't going to be deterred by that, David, and I just want you to know, I found a little Japanese toy company called Little Island that is uh, proposing to make a little mini-me for $2,700, okay, <laughs> and claims that these little dolls can be taught and can even be given my own voice. On the other hand, the Japanese National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology is offering HRP-4C for $258,000, 20 million yen, without a face. David Hansen. David. Hi there. My background uh, kind of brings together some of the robotics, the hardcore robotics, and uh, the world of arts. Let's see if we can. So, um, the the objective here is to um, achieve uh, character in robots. So by character, I mean um, like an agent, a being, a human-like being. Um, but I also mean um, like moral character, wisdom, machine wisdom. At some point in the future, our machines may surpass human-level capabilities. Um, so my objective is to make robots as human-like as possible um, in the core of their being as well as a, in the surface of their being. This will show you a little bit about my background. Um, I have a degree in film, animation, video from Rhode Island School of Design. I had some sculpture capabilities, so I worked as a sculptor for a while, but I also had some engineering um, in my background and a drive to make uh, human-like robots. So after working for Disney Imagineering as a sculptor, I moved into robotics development, taking some of the robotics work that I did in undergrad and uh, transforming it um, into human-like robots. So um, this is work that I did um, after leaving Disney and starting uh, on my PhD at the University of Texas at Dallas. So um, some of the persistent problems in um, uh, entertainment and humanoid robots that I had seen um, included really poor aesthetics and expressivity, which was um, actually a technical problem. Um, so, um, so I address some of the technical issues, which included uh, materials, some material science issues, um, uh, mechanics in affecting the facial expressions, and then bringing these cutting edge um, material science mechanics and um, uh, robot controls into um, a lightweight, low power battery operated head um, that uh, could mount on a walking humanoid robot. So the... Um, Behind um, the eyes that you're looking at are um, high-resolution CCD cameras, which uh, feed um, some software to uh, um, a video signal to software, which can perceive faces, see faces, um, and that can control the robot to make eye contact with you. So um, there's there are some solutions for computer vision that work all right. All right. Robots can't see anything um, uh, to the level of humans, but we're able to at this point, do a sketch of a human, a sketch of, an, of a science fiction android. So my goal is to bring those, um, those dreams of science fiction um, to reality. Let's 
just kind of move along. And this fits into um, a larger domain called, that I consider to be intelligent character machines. These would be machines that appeal to our innate sensibility about what a being is, what a being should be. This is what fiction does so well, what, what animation does. It brings this kind of being into existence before your eyes and you start to believe that it's a real being. Well, by um, making these characters intelligent, they start to become real beings. These are um, actually AI-driven characters um, from uh, uh, software um, from a company called Massive. They won the Academy Award for The Lord of the Rings for their autonomous um, uh, character-driven animation. And now they're like the standard for background characters. Um, but you see these characters coming out in many forms, computer games, um, uh, simulations, um, but also real robots. I mean, these are robots from the last 15 years, actually the last 10 years, that, um, that have started to become more lifelike than ever. Smarter than ever, the hardware is more capable, more physically capable, and they're also more popular. There's been a, um, a, a widespread um, uh, increasing rate of adoption for robotics and intelligent technologies. Some of this is driven by um, well-known uh, trends in improving hardware technology, um, uh, and there's, uh, these are sort of, uh, stolen from Ray Kurzweil's um, work, um, which shows uh, you know, that, that uh, in terms of the computational power, um, we're starting to get close to sort of higher level organisms and um, very low cost um, computing. Computational neuroscience is beginning to um, create computational models for the way that we think, the way that animals think. And so then you have low cost computing getting more powerful, algorithms getting more powerful. Um, well then what happens um, you know, once they surpass human level intelligence. This is the subject of science fiction, uh, philosophers. Well, maybe in the next 10, 15, 20, maybe 50 years, um, we'll actually have to deal with these issues. So we need to start thinking about this. When we come back. This is where the art and the engineering have to fuse because every single facial expression has to look as good as though it were sculpted. However, it's the materials and the mechanics that are achieving the sculptural form. Get the latest Idea City news instantly. Follow us on Twitter. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. So the robot in the center um, image uh, and the lower right image are um, uh, robots that were developed with uh, DARPA funding, that's the Def Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency of the United States, sort of the Blue Sky Research um, Division. And um, these uh, robots are physically capable of uh, navigating through diverse terrain for transporting um, uh, materiel, war supplies, um, to um, troops in deployment. Um, so um, the the physical capability of uh, the Boston Dynamics robots. Um, it's bio-inspired. It's, it's really, uh, really the stuff of science fiction. R really amazing. So this thing uh, you know, carries a big pack. The robot in the lower right um, movie is uh, autonomously navigating through an urban environment. Um, uh, the Stanford team that, um, that's the focus of this video also developed um, a robot that drove itself autonomously from uh, Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Um, so there is a really big push for military robots. Um, well, if these robots actually do surpass human level creative intelligent capabilities at some point in our lifetime, we want to make sure that they have empathy, that they have compassion, that they get along well with us, that they are wise. So we have to start to understand what that means and start to explore that in machines. Or else, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a chance that these machines could be sociopathic, they could be psychopathic. We know where that goes, you know, from all the science fiction that we see. So, by developing character robots, the intention is to plant the seed of um, robots that understand us, robots that we can understand, robots that we can collaborate with. Fortunately, our nervous system is engineered, it's built in such a way that we inherently um, respond to human faces, human faces and human facial expressions. We want to engage with characters. Um, and there's a lot of neuroscience about this. But there's also um, sort of proof in the market, proof in our personal lives. We know this to be true. We love characters. And so robotics, technology, and um, AI-driven char uh, characters for video games, not surprisingly, are like very popular. 
But um, some of the um, some of the technology drawbacks with this previous work um, were my target when I went into um, my PhD studies. Uh, what we did was we took the collected writings of Philip K. Dick, his journals, his letters, his interviews, um, and uh, thousands of pages. He was a compulsive writer. He just always wrote. Um, uh, every day he wrote um, 60, 70 pages. We took this and uh, did a semantic analysis on it, and then we had a semantic search. So we were able to have this conversation with this um, deceased writer. It was like bringing his ghost back. And some of the stuff that he would say was really, really surprising. So. Um, uh, it's not nearly as smart as a person. We were just kind of cobbling together a lot of uh, state-of-the-art um, uh, artificial intelligence, which is not, it doesn't think like a person. However, we were able to create the illusion of a person. Sometimes it would fool people. People would think that this was a person until they would walk around and see the back of the head. And, you know, the back of the head was missing and motors were moving. So, um, so and it was an homage to the, um, to the work of Philip K. Dick, which was all about um, the question, what is human? What are we? Let's see we can get this. So now, technology-wise, how do we achieve this? Well, um, we're bringing together numerous disciplines, uh, mechatronic design, software design. Um, we're bringing together sculpture, hand-sculpted um, uh, robots. And um, we're also bringing together uh, cognitive science, trying to understand the architecture of the mind, replicate that in um, a robot as best we are able to do at this time, an intelligent machine. And then we are also trying to understand how people perceive robots and each other so that we can model the social interaction of people with each other and with the robots. Um, a lot of this work was done, um, as you can see, in an apartment on a ridiculous uh, student loan kind of budget. Um, but I was able to um, tackle some of the material science issues um, with uh, four um, significant innovations where we're able to design the porosity of a particular material to emulate um, human facial flesh uh, much more effectively so then the material can compress into the kind of expressions that you see. We characterized the material to show that it um, was requiring 22 times less force than uh, previous materials, which enabled the battery-operated um, uh, you know, uh, low-cost uh, walking robots. I'll get to the low-cost part in a minute, as Moses was pointing out. Okay, so um, uh, we explored some of the um, some novel geometries, and then also electroactive polymer actuator um, and devices. This one is a, a, a piezo polymer composite actuator under a National Science Foundation grant. So uh, collaborating with a number of researchers at the um, Jet Propulsion Lab and several other groups. Um, but we're also bringing together um, artists. This is a uh, work by um, a fellow who's at the um, my company right now, um, visiting from Rhode Island School of Design. Her name is Catherine Batiste, really quite talented. Um, after we get a sculpture, that's a por the sculpture of Einstein, then we uh, create a mold and do a reverse uh, sculpt for the skull. We generate um, uh, a plot for the facial expressions, how the facial expressions will be generated. And um, so this is where the art and the engineering have to fuse, because every single facial expression has to look as good as though it were sculpted. However, it's the materials and the mechanics that are achieving the sculptural form. But then once the robot itself is able to move, then you have to have the software system that, that uh, moves it. This is the software architecture from the Philip K. Dick robot, um, done in collaboration with Andrew Olney from um, the University of Memphis Auto Tutor Group. So you have um, some perceptual level, some decisions, and then an output that controls the robot. So um, uh, we pull all this stuff together into um, a software package that we're calling the character engine, but actually this is actually a sort of a loose agglomeration of many processes, many um, software, some inside that we've authored and some from outside. Um, at this point, we've been able to achieve um, sort of real-time interaction, um, open domain speech uh, recognition and conversation. Um, in the future, we're looking to create these um, uh, genetic type models of uh, the world, of um, uh, how people are feeling when they're interacting with the robot. The robot needs to understand who you are, um, your relationship with the robot, how you feel, and where you've been, where you're going. And um, so it really has to become extremely adaptive to start becoming um, really intelligent. In order to achieve this, we can't do it alone. We have to collaborate. So, um, so me and some friends have um, formed a nonprofit um, initiative uh, with the goal of achieving greater than human level creative genius in machines by 2019. When we come back. When we put the robot in with the autistic kids, they, they began to um, uh, 
imitate spontaneously the facial expressions on the robot. They were able to recognize the facial expressions on the robot, and they started to engage with the therapist. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. This is electric field sensing with one of the robot characters that we've developed is tracking your hand with an electric field. We're also doing um, uh, some uh, face perception in collaboration with the University of California at San Diego. So these are um, perceiving the facial expressions in a user. And then the robot will track your face, track salience in the fee scene. So when something moves, then it glances at that. Audio localization. Um, means that it looks when there's sound. And then here um, you'll see the robot, if it plays, robot mimicking facial expressions. Well, in any case, you'll, it just uh, mirrors your facial expressions. We're bringing in cutting edge uh, computer animation software. We have actually been working with Massive um, and Maya to generate um, uh, extremely realistic uh, motions. So this, this is an example of a robot that is taking um, saccade patterns um, that are bio-derived, putting these into a procedural algorithm. So when it sees faces, then it looks from face to face in the manner um, uh, very similar to human. So statistically, it's derived from human eye contact data. So... So we've been uh, working with, the, uh, with numerous labs, University of Geneva Mirror Lab. This shows some of the facial expressions. It's a portrait of my wife, Amanda, actually. They've been doing some motion capture work um, where they, uh, they do, take state-of-the-art motion capture data and then animate the, the robot um, so that it mimics uh, facial expressions. And this is... Um, a little video of the robot singing with that. Je ne rêve plus, je ne fume plus, je ne m'aime plus. So just pay attention to some of the, the very um, subtle motions around the, the mouth. Je suis laide sans toi, je suis comme une orpheline. Dans un dortoir, je n'ai plus envie de vivre ma vie. So by creating these um, complex emotional models within the robot, by capturing um, emotional data from people and building a complex emotional system in the robot, we think we can start to enable the robots to feel what we feel and to begin to empathize with humans. We think that's the foundation for achieving compassionate, intelligent machines. We're, we're working with uh, the United Arab Emirates University. We've created a portrait of the 10th century Arab philosopher Ibn Sena, who is a Renaissance man. We have uh, some arms that we built for them as well. So I'd like to show you some of the preliminary results very quickly from um, some tests that we did um, running these robots with autistic kids in uh, autism therapy. So um, uh, this is with the, in conjunction with the University of Pisa um, and University of Messina. And we built a, uh, a robot um, named Mia, Alicia. Um, uh, and we put the robot um, in uh, an experiment with autistic kids, this shows uh, what autistic, uh, how autistic brains um, are different from uh, normal brains. Uh, normal brains will um, uh, have certain pathways that lead towards conversational engagement that fire up when you're interacting with a person, but in autistic people, even though you perceive it, the autistic individual may perceive a face, you don't see um, the, um, it doesn't fire up the social interaction. But when we put the robot in with the autistic kids, they started to um, uh, show affect um, that they had never shown with people. They, they began to um, 
uh, imitate spontaneously the facial expressions on the robot. They were able to recognize the facial expressions on the robot, and they started to engage with the therapist. So seven autistic kids in this preliminary study, and every single one of them um, uh, responded socially. So uh, they usually only respond that way with uh, machinery. So by bringing together um, realistic human-like facial expressions in a humanoid robot, we think that um, it's triggering the, um, the social brain that normally would not be triggered in an autistic individual. So the, um, uh, we're w awaiting the results from the fMRI um, scans, but, uh, but so far it looks very promising in these therapy applications. So I need to say thank you to my team and sponsors, but, um, and especially thank you to you for you, having me here. Thank you. Machines uh, awaken if they become like fully conscious and creative. Then those machines need to have values, deep values, shared values with the human species. There's no guarantee that the machines won't be psychotic, and if we cannot engineer them to be friendly, then there's. Uh, some probability that they could go terribly awry.